Okay, we're back to paint for this one. You're gonna unlock Photoshop at 10k, so you know, get those numbers up. A lot of people, especially the ones in high school, aren't quite sure what they want to get into yet. And cybersecurity is such a broad field and just IT in general has so many different options. In this video, I'm gonna go over something that I think a lot of people might find interesting. And you can use it as a test to see if you're actually interested in cybersecurity. So that way you don't end up wasting any time in the future going down the wrong profession or whatever. Let me explain about an exploit that was found somewhat recently that affects Discord, Signal, and Telegram. I'm going to explain this in a very non-technical way so that anybody can understand it, even complete beginners. It allows you to get their general location in one click without them even pressing anything by just sending a friend request. So let's say that you are on your computer right now, your little laptop. This is going to be called a client. And then you have a server. The server is going to store a lot of useful information that lets you access websites like watching this video, for example. So the way you get that resource is by sending a request to the server, which then processes it and sends you a response. The response is then taken by your browser and displayed onto your screen. So you can actually have a visual representation of what the server sent to you because the request actually looks like this and on your browser, it might look like this. Okay. But now let's say we have a bunch of these clients and they all want to access the same server. Well, now it's going to be quite a lot more load on the server. The server is going to have to do a lot of loading and it might overwhelm the server. So what can we do to fix that? Well, one of the options would be just add more servers. So that way it would be distributed a bit better. Let's say that we want to get this image from a server or if we had multiple servers, all of the servers would need to have this image stored somewhere on them so that they could send it forward to the client. So then what if we had a bunch of clients that wanted to get that resource, but only one server had it? Well, for some clients, the distance is going to be pretty small, so it's not going to take that long for it to reach the client. But for some other clients, it might actually take a while. And then the website would take quite a few seconds to just send a single image and that would not be optimal. So then what would we do? Would we just load the image on every single server? So in that case, the closest server could just send it to that client instead of having all of that extra distance and extra delay. Yeah, that kind of works, but we also have a problem there because that would mean that we would need this image to be stored on every single server. And that just takes up a lot of space for no reason. So a better way to do this would be to use content distribution networks, also known as CDNs. And if you've ever checked out the Discord link, you might see that it starts with CDN dot. It's a content distribution network. What this actually means is that they have a separate area. One way to visualize this is if we had multiple clients and all of them wanted to communicate with the server to get the same image. Instead of them sending a request and the client sending the image back to every single one of them and having all of these requests go through, what the server is actually going to do is it's going to find the closest CDN content distribution network. And then when the client requests the image, it's instead going to send it to the CDN. And this is just going to store it. This storing is called caching. And then obviously it's going to send it to the client that originally requested the picture. Okay, cool. But what if another client requests it? Well, he's going to try to talk to the server. The server is going to realize, well, we already have this connection right here. We already sent the image over. So now I can just send it to him straight from the CDN. And it's the same story here. Boom, boom, just like that. So basically, instead of needing to make so many back and forth connections to the servers, it just uses this little middleman to send the image over much quicker. So there's way less load on the actual server. Now, how can we exploit this? Let's try to rethink about what this actually does. What if the server has a bunch of these content distribution networks, which is usually what happens, and then a client. I, I cannot draw a circle, can I? So what if we created our own image? In this case, this is going to be our image. And this is going to be the profile picture for the account that we use. Whenever we send a friend request to somebody, they would have to get our profile picture somehow so that they can actually see it on their screen. Because otherwise, how would they be able to have our profile picture if we don't send it to them somehow? But we never really send people our profile pictures directly. Instead, the profile picture is stored on the server. And just like before, the server's default behavior when it's connected to a CDN is to send that profile picture to the closest content distribution network. Now here's the part where we can use this to find people's locations. What if we can somehow write a tool to scan every CDN and figure out where it is? Well, we would realize that it's not in most of them. And then we would find one which actually stored our image. As we've discussed earlier, the image will be cached on the CDN that is closest to the client requesting it. So this means that we can determine that the client is not close to this one 
and not that close to this one so the client has to be the closest to this one because that's where it was cached so with this we can tell the client's general location now let's switch to another map here is a map of the cloud for cdns and this is what happens when i send a friend request to you i click send friend request i send a request to the general server to do that action for me the server sends the friend request to you when it does that it also has to send my profile picture so that it can show up that i have sent you a friend request and it shows my name and my profile picture and stuff instead of the server directly sending the profile picture to you it will store it in a cdn regardless if you accept my friend request or not then i can simply cancel the friend request you can no longer see it but now my profile picture is out of all of these locations all over the world in the one that is closest to you. So if I can write a tool to go through all of these places and check for my profile picture to see if it's inside of one of them, that means that I will be able to always find your approximate location relative to the server. And if you have multiple servers around you, this can be surprisingly accurate. In some cases, it might only tell you the user's country, but in some cases, it might even show you their city. All of this in one click. And that's exactly what Daniel did, the person that discovered this. He wrote a whole report on it, and this is a Discord bot that he made that automatically does this pretty cool right i wanted to show you this because most of us use discord so you probably found this pretty cool so this person got pretty creative and used some basic network technologies to be able to find someone's general location without them even clicking on anything i think that's a pretty cool concept so if you just heard all of this and you found that quite interesting and your first reaction was oh that's cool then you might be interested in tech but how do you know if you're interested in cybersecurity specifically Let's use ChatGPT now. What if I told you that the NSA is very good at finding some crazy stuff and one day they found an exploit that would let them access pretty much any Windows machine. Meanwhile, the rest of the world was completely clueless towards it. By default, the SMBV1 protocol would be enabled in most Windows machines. And there was a vulnerability in it that the NSA discovered, which let them execute any code they wanted on that machine anywhere in the world, pretty much. Sounds pretty cool, right? What do you think when you hear that? Is your first instinct just, yeah, that's kind of cool. Is it, I don't really care. Or do you want to learn more about it? Are you wondering what is a protocol? They said they found a vulnerability in a protocol, but what does a protocol actually do? How do you find a vulnerability in it? So then let's dig a bit deeper. Basically, it's a rule set that governs the communication between two systems so that they make sure that they can communicate in a way that they can understand each other. In human terms, a protocol is pretty much like a language. If we speak the same language, we might be able to communicate. But if we were instructed to use different languages that the other person doesn't understand, it would be a lot harder. So then you might think, how do you find a vulnerability in a set of instructions? And while we're on it, let's find out how the SMBV1 protocol had its vulnerability. So apparently, since we're talking about security and not languages, some protocols could be somewhat insecure. They maybe had bad architecture or people found ways to break them, in which case they were later redesigned more securely, which is exactly what happened with this one. SMBV1 became SMBV3. So the way the original one was designed is that it had a buffer overflow. So it turned out that SMPV1 had a buffer overflow vulnerability. What, what does that mean? So they used improper handling of specifically crafted packets. What is a packet? Let's ask that. What is a specially crafted packet? What is a buffer overflow? And how does it lead to RCE? And then we have all of these answers. And basically now we're just going down the rabbit hole and we're starting to learn more about the technology that was used for this exploit. This is what it means to have a passion for cybersecurity. When I tell you about an exploit, you don't just think, cool, you can't kind of want to dig a bit deeper and understand more about it because it interests you. And this is one of the most important skills in cybersecurity. It's not about how much you already know. It's about how much you want to know and how much passion you have and how much interest. Because even if somebody knows a lot more than you and it might seem that they're an expert compared to you, if that person doesn't really care and they just do it as a job and you're actually passionate about it, you will know more than them in probably a year or two. So who cares that currently they know more than you? And who cares that you're a complete beginner? The thing that matters the most is that you're actually interested and everything else is just going to come along the way. So yeah, if you're the type of person to hear about an exploit and your first thought is oh that's interesting i want to learn more about it and then you want to learn about the underlying technology and you keep going deeper and deeper and you, you want to understand more and you have this deep curiosity for what's happening under the hood and it makes you wonder what sorts of exploits are out there that we haven't found and what exploits could i find then you know what Cybersecurity might just be for you but if you're still a bit younger and you don't really care about the job that much i would say just explore go crazy go all over the environment check out every area in cybersecurity and programming and find which suits you best i would say just find what you're passionate 
passionate about. That's the most important thing. And when you're going to have a job that you actually enjoy, your life is going to be so much better than working in a place that you hate or attending a university just to get a job that you don't even want just because your parents told you that you should go to uni. And a lot of people that do that end up dropping out in a year or two anyway. So if you want to take a year off after high school, that's fine. If you don't know what to do yet, that's fine. Just don't rush into something that you don't want. That was one of my mistakes and I deeply regret it. There are also some amazing cybersecurity documentaries out there and I'm going to recommend some of them on the screen right now. There's so much high quality content that isn't made in paint, but I try to do my part and generally guide you in your journey. But now it's your turn. Figure out what you want. It's your life after all. Thanks for watching. If you have any more questions, hop on Discord and bye.